Thanks again for joining me here at ButNowMinistry.org. And today we're going to go through a gospel track that was given to me a couple days ago by a rather zealous Baptist lady from Marquette Manor Baptist Church. And when she gave this to me, I gave her one of my cards that has the gospel, the grace of God on the back of it also. And what's amazing is, is after I had received this gospel track from her and after I had given her my card and she looked at the back and I said well that's the gospel that saves you today first Corinthians 15 1 through 4 I said all you need to do is trust that and you're saved okay when I after she had left and I was looking at the track that she gave me I noticed in the track that she also had in this track first Corinthians 15 1 through 4 Okay, but I didn't read, I just kind of briefly looked through the track. I noticed quickly that they were mixing the prophecy program with the mystery program. Okay, they're using verses from the Old Testament and the New Testament and combining and conflating them with Paul's writings. And we know in Romans 11:6, Paul warns us, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more of grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And unfortunately, when you don't separate the church, the body of Christ, from the prophetic, Israel's prophetic program, it leads to doctrinal error. Okay, when you attempt to mix law and grace, prophecy and mystery, and the body of Christ in Israel, you are going to produce, and I'm going to show you this, you're going to produce a gospel tract that makes the cross of Christ of none effect. And again, it goes against Paul's writings in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, and again, for us that which is most evil, okay, and I don't know how much I can stress this, it's not homosexuality, it's not drugs, it's not fornication, okay? What's the most evil thing is, is wrong doctrine. Wrong doctrine is why hell is going to be littered with water-baptized, commandment-keeping, possession-selling people. Okay, and that's most of your churchgoers today. Okay, they're trying to fulfill the Great Commission or the Great Commandment. When Jesus was clearly talking to Israel, he was talking to the eleven when he told, when he issued that commission, he never talked to us in the red letters. But when you tell somebody that, they will argue with you until the day they die. And when you bring them back to the verse, and it says Jesus spoke to the eleven, and Jesus came for his own, and Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and Jesus is only a minister to the circumcision, and Jesus was born under the law, when you tell them those verses, they don't believe it. They only want to believe what their pastor has told them. They only want to believe what their commentaries told them. They only want to believe what their seminary professor told them, and not the Bible. Most do not believe God gave us a perfectly preserved Bible, our 1769 King James Bible, perfect without error. They will always say they need the originals, but we don't have them. So if we don't have them, then it couldn't be perfect. And on and on it goes. So as we go through this track, I want to, for one, make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. That is my job as a minister of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. When you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul declares it's the gospel in verse 1. In verse 2, it's how ye are saved. In verse 3, that Christ died for your sins. In verse 4, that he was buried and rose again on the third day. When you trust that, you are saved. Okay, You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You are saved from the wrath to come. You're seated in heavenly places. You've been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, not physical. You're going to get a new body, so you don't have to worry about the one today. And you're complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You have peace with God, Romans 5, 1. And these are all the spiritual blessings that you've been given. These are all the blessings that you need to believe by faith, that you need to trust that those blessings are given to you. Okay, You're not in a kingdom, commandment-keeping, possession-selling program. Okay, You are in the program of the free gift, 
where your law works mean nothing, Galatians 2.16, where your righteous works mean nothing, Titus 3.5, where your boasting and yourself means absolutely nothing. It's all about the free gift of God that Christ died for your sins. Okay? And we're going to take a look at this track. Does this track make the gospel of the grace of God that clear? Because if it does not, then it makes the cross of Christ of none effect. Okay, Philippians chapter 3 makes that clear. If they're minding earthly things, the cross of Christ is none effect. Colossians 2.8 makes it very clear. If it's traditions of men and wisdom of the world and you know holidays and times, days, months, times, and years and... and um, wisdom of words and and all those sorts of things it makes the cross of Christ of none effect okay and again as we go through this track you will see that it makes the cross of Christ of none effect the title of the track is the importance of one and you can get these tracks from the importance of one dot com so you can even look it up I'm going to have pictures of it here on, on this message, but here it goes. Where you choose to spend eternity is, most, is the most important decision you'll ever make. Some people think they are many, there are many ways to eternal life or that any belief will lead to heaven. In the Bible, however, Jesus Christ tells us that there is only one way to have eternal life, and that is through Him. Now notice... And I've taught you this in past messages. Scripture has, there's three ways of interpreting Scripture. Doctrinal, spiritual, or historical. Okay? And when we go to the Old Testament for doctrine, we usually go there for definition. We go there for historical facts. We go there, might even get some spiritual truth. Okay? But we never go there for our doctrine because we know it's for Israel. Okay? But yet, they pull out verses out of context on this track and they tell you that it's for you today. Okay? Now, it can be for us today if you tell the reader that it is definition. Okay? Because they take us to John 14.6 and they take us to Acts 4.12 and they take us to 2 Peter 3.9. Now we know John 14.6 is Old Testament doctrine for Israel under the law. We know Acts 4.12 is New Testament doctrine for Israel under the law. And we know in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 is New Testament doctrine under the law for Israel. So these are all Israel's verses that they take and give us definition of eternal life. Okay, but they don't tell you that. And the other thing they don't tell you is what version are they using? What Bible are they using? There is no Bible reference on this track. So I have no idea if I first picked this track up, off, let's say off the ground or someone gave it to me, I would not know what Bible they're using or if they're even using a Bible because we know on this station all new translations are not Bibles. They're translations. And they have at least 70 errors in them. <clears throat> and they remove the name of the Lord Jesus Christ more than 200 times. So why anybody in their right mind would call that a Bible is beyond me. But the people that usually say that those are Bibles are the ones that think they have the originals. So what does that tell you? So anyway, here it goes. We're going to the Old Testament for definition but they don't tell you that so because they don't tell you that they just say John 14 6 Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me and Acts 4 12 neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and Jesus Christ is in parentheses okay Although God is specific about eternal life and how it is obtained, he is also very compassionate. The Lord is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish. Now, clearly, that is Israel's doctrine, okay? Israel is going back to their father, right? Israel is God's firstborn son, Exodus 4.22, and that's clearly what John 14.6 states. They have to trust in the name of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what Acts 4.12 states. That's what Israel has to do. They have to believe in the Messiah. 
and they have to um, get water baptized for remission of sins, Acts 2.38, and then they'll receive the Holy Ghost, right? But they don't tell you that. They only give you one verse. And then in Second Peter, which is New Testament and it's tribulation doctrine for Israel as they're going through the end times, as they're going through the tribulation, the Lord is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish. So he doesn't want any of Israel to perish as they go through the tribulation. So, unfortunately, they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that they're getting definition from Old and New Testament. They put it all together, and thus, yes, those are verses about having eternal life, but it is for Israel. God offers eternal life as a free gift to all who will receive it. Well, the verses that they gave us just above that I just went through, those are not a free gift. Israel's doctrine always requires them to keep the commandments, sell all their possessions, believe in the Messiah, and get water baptized, and they get just get remission of sin. They don't have a free gift, okay? And that is why this gospel track makes the cross of Christ of none effect, because you cannot mix the two doctrines. You cannot mix prophecy with the revelation of the mystery. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 25, and Colossians chapter 1, 25 and 26. So, unfortunately, um, they're making the cross of Christ of not, not a fact. God offers eternal life as a free gift, but you're not going to find that free gift in those verses above to all who will receive it. In these few pages, you will discover the importance of one, whatever that may be. God placed Adam and Eve the first man and woman in the Garden of Eden. He gave them the ability to choose between good and evil. When Adam was tempted by Satan, he chose to disobey God. Now this is wrong, okay? Because when you look at the verses, you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, you will see, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Well, here they say Adam was tempted. That is wrong. My Bible's right. If you go to 1 Timothy 2.14, it says very clear who was deceived and who was not. Here they say Adam was tempted. My Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So he makes it very clear also in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So clearly, Adam was not deceived, 1 Timothy 2, 14. So hopefully that clears things up for you guys, because people don't believe their Bibles, People claim that Adam was deceived, just like they do here in this track. That is wrong on the authority of God's perfectly preserved word, 1 Timothy 2.14. And so it goes, Because of one man's sin, every person born since then has inherited a sinful nature and is spiritually separated from God. A desire to disobey God. Romans 5.19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Okay, We choose to sin, disobey God, because of our sinful nature. Therefore, we are sinners by birth and by choice. So if we're sinners by birth, how is it by choice? That doesn't make sense. We're born into sin. Why are we born into sin? Because God cursed the world. God cursed Adam. Okay? This isn't difficult, guys. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. And they take us again. The first verse, they said, for one by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Romans 5.19. Now we jump to James. So Romans is clearly written according to the revelation of the mystery, the Apostle Paul's writings. Then we jump to James. Who did James write to? James 1.1 1, 1 tells us that James wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel. So James's letter, also on the authority of Galatians 2 verse 9, that he's a minister to the circumcision. So James is a minister to the circumcision. That would be Israel under the law. Okay, For them to be under the law, for them to keep the commandments, they had to be circumcised. Okay, 
So James clearly is writing to the 12 tribes who are circumcised, but yet they put this verse and they put it on us. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. Okay? Each and every day you sin. Each and every day you don't do good. Okay? That's why James is not for us. Israel has to do good. Israel is able to do good because they get the New Testament promises that are in Hebrews chapter 8, Jeremiah 31, and Ezekiel 36, where they need not to be taught anymore and they have the law on their heart. Okay? Clearly, and if after they get the law on their heart and they need not to be taught anymore and they sin, that is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That is the unpardonable sin. Okay? We don't have to worry about that in the dispensation of grace. But we have to worry about it when people are giving wrongful tracts out that ultimately hurt people and can send their souls to hell. Okay? Every person has the same spiritual problem, sin. Is it by birth or is it by choice? They can't figure it out in this tract. But the Bible states this about all humankind. Okay? If you go to Psalm 51, it tells you that we were born into sin. Okay, There is none righteous, no not one. And by the way, you go to Psalm 51, which is Israel's doctrine, you go there for definition of how we are born into sin. Okay, Do you understand? Here we go. Now they're doing the Romans Road thing. Okay, Romans Road is a pretty popular track. But the problem with Romans Road, just like this track has the same problem, they tell you it's a free gift, but then they take you to Romans 10, 9, and 10 and tell you to confess with your mouth. If you confess with your mouth, that's a work. That is not then a free gift. And again, you make the cross of Christ of none effect. Romans 10, 9 was written, was Paul writing to Israel. Again, if you don't believe your Bible in its context, then you will not believe your Bible. Okay. The payment for sin is death. So figure that out. The payment for sin is death. Does that make sense? It's the penalty for sin that is death. The Bible explains the three aspects of death. Spiritual death is the lost spiritual condition in which we are all born. As a result of Adam's sin, we are born spiritually dead, separated from God. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Romans 5.12, okay? Physical death is when we cease to function with an earthly body. Contrary to how it may appear, this visible physical death is not the end of our existence, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And in parentheses, they have payment, and then here they have the payment for sin is death, and in parentheses, they have penalty. So they're, I think they're a little confused there. Eternal death is separation from God in hell. It is the fate of every person who has not believed on Jesus Christ as Savior. Then they take us back to Israel's New Testament doctrine. Because remember, Israel gets the New Testament after Christ dies on the cross. And that's on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. And this is Matthew 25. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. And that would be anybody during... Israel's kingdom program that does not believe in their Messiah. That is what Matthew 25 is talking about. It has nothing to do with us today, the church for the church, the body of Christ. Anyway, do you understand that the penalty for sin is eternal separation from God? Now that you understand that the penalty for sin is death, it helps you see the importance of the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus God's only son was 100% God and 100% man. So right there gives you a clue of what translation they might be using. They might be using the New International Version because the New International Version in John, that would be John 3.16. So let's take a look at John 3.16. I want to throw a couple of these verses out at you. John 3.16 you know the verse, but I'm going to read it right out of some of the different translations here. 
And then we're going to see if it's right, according to God's word. Okay, And here it is, John 3.16 in the New International Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And by the way, this was also a commercial on Sunday nights during that show called the Bible. Okay, And this is what they advertised, thinking that they're going to get people saved. Okay, This is wrong. This is doctrine for Israel. This is in the Old Testament. And the church, the body of Christ, is non-existent. It's kept secret. It's not here. It's not found. This is all Israel's doctrine. This is Jesus Christ speaking to Israel and those who are not Israel at that time. But anyway, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. His one and only Son is the New International Version. Now, what does the Bible, what does the Bible say about his one and only Son? What does it say in Exodus 4.22? Do you guys know? Exodus 4.22 says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Wow. So God has another son. So if God has another son, according to Exodus 4.22, how can this verse be right? That he gave his one and only son. That is wrong. Jesus Christ was not his one and only son. He had another son. It was Exodus and ex it was Israel in Exodus 4:22. So this gospel track again does not believe what the Bible says, and they're trusting in the New International Version's text. And so is the show The Bible that aired on Sunday night on NBC which is clearly wrong, not according to me, not according to my pastor, not according to the commentator, but according to God's perfectly preserved word. God had more than one son. But this track says that God has an only son, and that would be Jesus Christ. That is wrong. But anyway, Jesus, the Son of God, was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 14 through 15. Again, they're going to, to Hebrews and basically telling, the, telling us that that's a verse for us today. They're not telling you that they're going there for definition of how Christ became sin for us. Okay? And again, they're not telling you what translation. I am telling you, though, that they get God's one and only Son from the New International Version, which we know on the authority of the making of a contemporary translation by Baker, he even admits, the very man that put the NIV together, that the NIV doesn't even have 4% of the critical text. It's a dynamic equivalent of nothing. And as you can clearly see, it states that God has only one son when the Bible says, God says, he has more than one. He has two. The other being Israel. So he willingly obeyed the Father by coming to earth, living a sinless life, and dying on the cross in our place. Romans 5.19, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And then Romans 5.8, but God commendeth, and in parentheses proved, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible also says that after Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was buried and rose from the dead three days later. Now here's like what I said in the beginning. When I just skimmed through it, I noticed that they had 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and I was excited because that's the gospel that saves you. You can get rid of all the rest of these verses, all the mixing up of doctrine, and just have that verse, and that's what will save people. These four verses in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You can have 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 on your bumper sticker, and that is what will save people. That is the power of God unto salvation. That is the gospel, the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Don't add any preservatives. Don't add anything to that. No preservatives, no substitutes, just the gospel, the grace of God. That is what saves people today. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, shall we? 
I declare unto you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, did you notice anything interesting in that, on the track, in those verses that I just read? They don't have verse 2. In verse 2, it says, it's how ye are saved. They don't have that verse within the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So how do you know that that's the gospel that saves you? You don't. Let me read it again. I declare unto you the gospel. Skip verse 2. Verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, verse 4. No verse 2 where Paul claims and declares that it's how ye are saved. How sad is that? So you would not know on this track what is the gospel of the grace of God. Because they took a verse out of the gospel of the grace of God. The very verse that states... It's how ye are saved. Then it goes on to say, Heaven is a perfect place without sin. Therefore, man's sin must be paid for before entering God's presence, heaven. Jesus paid that penalty for you and provided the only way to enter heaven. You must believe he did this for you in order to be saved from your sin. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then where do they take you? John 3.16, with another translation, this from the New American Standard. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice, not one and only Son, like it said on the page before from the New International Version, but now only begotten Son. So which is it? Do these people have a final authority? They don't. Believing is not merely acknowledging that Jesus exists or that he was a good person. Believing is trusting. So yeah, so tell that to your Mormon friend, okay? Believing is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. You must have faith that he died for you, paid the price for your sin, and is the only way to heaven. And then guess what they give you? They tell you it's a free gift. They tell you you have to have faith that he died for you that he paid the price for your sin. That's the only way to heaven. That's what they just told you. That's what believing is. And then what do they tell you to do? Thou, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that looks like it might be from the King James Bible. Romans 10, 9. So now they're telling you to do works when Christ, through the Apostle Paul, tells us it's a free gift. Paul tells us that it's without works, Galatians 2.16. Paul tells us it's without our righteous works, Titus 3.5. Paul tells us it's not of yourself. So if it's not of yourself, where does confessing with your mouth come in? If there's no boasting, where does confessing with your mouth come in? It doesn't, because it's a free gift, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. So they just made the cross of Christ of none effect. They, just, they made the cross of Christ of none effect right from the beginning when they gave us Acts to Romans to James, mixing prophecy with mystery. That goes against Pauline doctrine. Has there been a time in your life when you believed on Jesus Christ as Savior? Satan will try to convince you that there is a plenty of time to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior. It is his most dangerous strategy. The Bible reminds us, however, that we do not always know what lies ahead. That is wrong. Do you know what Satan's most dangerous strategy is? I'm going to tell you what it is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is Satan's strategy right here. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4.3 But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. This track hides the gospel. 
this track takes Paul's My Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and tells you that it's not how ye are saved. They took the verse out. Okay? That is what the devil is doing. The devil is in the doctrine. When you look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, what does it tell us? 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, verse 1, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The devil is in the doctrine. The devil is in all the different translations. The devil, from Genesis chapter 3 that we read in the beginning, when he beguiled Eve, the devil had Eve doubt God's words. That is what the devil is doing today. He is doubting God's word. And you're only going to see this in the King James Bible in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. There were many in Paul's time, just like today, 2,000 years later, that corrupt the Word of God, okay? These new translations are a corruption of the Word of God. That is what the devil is doing. He's in the doctrine, and he is putting out all different kinds of lights and obfuscating the one true light, the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what this tract does. This tract makes the gospel of the grace of God of none effect. It makes the cross of Christ of none effect. And, by the way, have you heard one thing about the revelation of the mystery in this track? Have you heard one thing about preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25? No. Have you heard anything in this track about being a good steward of the mysteries of God? No. No, not at all, right? Because it's a mystery to them. It's a mystery to the Baptists, okay? Where is ye know not what shall be on the morrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. And again, they take us to James chapter 4, which we know James only wrote to the circumcision. James only wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel. James 1.1 1, 1 and Galatians 2.9 gives us the authority to say that. Okay? Would you like to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior right now? Now they take you through the sinner's prayer. So, so what is it that saves you on this track? Is it Jesus Christ? Is it the gospel, the grace of God? Is it just believing on Jesus? Is it confessing with your mouth? Is it praying the sinner's prayer? Is it believing in his one and only son when he has two? What is it? I'm confused with this track. But hey, maybe if I pray sincerely. What if I don't pray sincerely? Will I be saved? When I confess with my mouth, what do I have to confess? What about the sins that I don't remember? How does that work? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and that I deserve hell. I believe that you died on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin, and rose from the dead three days later. I am placing my faith in you alone to forgive my sin and save me. Thank you for giving me eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. So if he or she is praying this sinner's prayer, are they trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection as a free gift? Or do they trust that they have to do this? Do they trust that they have to confess plus what Jesus did? Because if that's what you think saves you, if you think Jesus did his part and now you must do your part to get saved or stay saved, Write down what your part is, okay? Maybe it's praying the sinner's prayer. Maybe it's confessing with your mouth. Write those down and at the top of the page, write why I'm going to hell because that's why you're going. You're not trusting in that Christ died for your sins because that's the gospel and that's it and that's it all by itself. All by itself, it's Christ dying for your sins. That's why you're saved. And you trust that he did that. You never saw it. You trust it by faith and that's why you're saved. Get rid of everything else on this track, and you're saved. Okay, And then here it is again. Hey, after all that, now you can know for sure. 
the assurance that you have eternal life is based on God's unchanging word. Unchanging word. If it's an unchanging word, why do they give us the New International Version where it's God's one and only Son? Then they give us the New American Standard where it's His begotten Son. That seems to be changing to me. The Bible provides this assurance to those who believe on Him. And they take you to John 3.36 and John 1.12, which will not save anybody today. Okay, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see the life. Is that the gospel of the grace of God? He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Are we saved from the wrath to come? Because of the gospel, the grace of God. Not because of anything that was said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nobody in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John goes to heaven. They all inherit the earthly kingdom. John 1.12 But as many as received him, who would that be? That would be Israel. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. That would be Israel. Even to them that believe on his name. When you trust in the gospel, the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. In verse 1, Paul declares it's the gospel. In verse 2, it's how ye are saved. In verse 3, that Christ died for your sins. In verse 4, that he was buried and rose again on the third day. Is there any mention about believing in his name in that gospel? No. That's why this makes the cross of Christ of none effect. You're going to Israel's program, then you're going to the Body of Christ program. You're going to the Mystery program, then you're going to the Prophecy program. You're going under the law, then you're, then you're going not under the law. You're going from keeping the commandments where the commandments will send you to hell. Two different programs. God does not lie. He has promised everlasting life to those who believe on Him as Savior. And then they take us to doctrine, Paul's doctrine according to the revelation of the mystery, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Okay, And then they take us to Israel's doctrine in Paul's writings, Romans 10-13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how loud do you have to call? I remember growing up, and this might date me a little bit, but when we were out playing all day and all night riding our bikes, my parents would call out the door, out the front door for dinner. Is that how loud we have to call on the Lord? Or is it a very soft, subtle call? Maybe, a, maybe Or is it silent prayer in my head that I call on the Lord? How do I call on the Lord? Because here it says I have to call on the Lord to be saved. But yet then, in Paul's other writings, he says, it's not of yourselves, there's no boasting. It's not of your righteous works. It's not of your law works. So again, you cannot mix Israel's doctrine with the church, the body of Christ. So the importance of one, the track that makes the cross of Christ of none effect. I hope you see that. I hope you understand what is the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3, 9. Because if you understand the preaching of the cross according to the revelation of the mystery, then you will understand how mixed up and wrong this tract is. And ultimately, this tract is sending souls to hell. Why? Because it makes the cross of Christ of none effect. Thanks again for listening. Email me at reckonyourselfdead at gmail.com. Check out my website at buttonowministry.wix.com slash buttonowministry. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Thanks again.